welcome to get into the Zoom room and we will get started momentarily. Good morning to those of you who are joining on Zoom. If you'll just give us a moment, we'll wait for everyone to enter into the room and we will get started momentarily. Good morning, my name is Ken Levinson. I'm the Executive Director of WIDA. We hope you're doing well and staying safe wherever you are. This is our 16th webinar since restrictions on meeting in person went into place in March. And even though you can't see everyone's faces, you should know that by taking part in these sessions, you're part of a global community of people interested in trade. We've now with today's session had over 5,000 participants on these Zoom sessions since, uh, since March from over 75 different countries and 36 US states. Last week, we started a new tradition, calling out the names of a few people who are on the session, just to give you a sense of who you are in community with while you're here today at the WIDA Zoom. So uh, welcome today to uh, David Salmonson of the American Farm Bureau, Susanna Choi with Aramco, uh, Ambassador Robert Holliman of Kroll and Mooring International, excuse me, Kroll and Mooring International, and Isabel DeWolf with the Washington State Department of Commerce. Welcome to them and welcome to all of you. Uh, we have several exciting sessions planned in the weeks to come. And because of the strong support of viewers, both uh, in the United States and around the world, it's our plan to continue hosting online webinar sessions, even after we're able to begin holding live in-person gatherings in Washington again, hopefully later this year. Next week, we have two really special events. On Tuesday, June 23rd, we're beginning a series of events to hear from candidates to be WTO Director General. We, in, we will invite all the announced nominees and are pleased that next Tuesday at noon Eastern to welcome Hamid Mamdua, the former Director of Trade and Services Investment Division at the WTO. He will be our first to join us. And like I said, we'll invite the other candidates as well. We hope you'll join us. Also next week at our regular Thursday time, we have a special presentation of Americans' attitudes towards reopening the economy, which has major implications for American businesses, workers, and, and trade uh, largely. Several of us have seen the presentation and it offers a fascinating glimpse of the views of average Americans think about reopening, and we hope you'll be able to join us. If you're watching this on Zoom, after discussion among our panelists, we'll uh, open it up to questions. There's a Q&A box on your Zoom screen you can use to ask questions, we'll, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, you also, if you registered on Zoom a few minutes ago, you should have received an email with the biographies in today's event program. So we won't have to go into great detail in the biographies, which you should have. But I will say this, we have an all-star panel today to discuss an issue that's both front of mind and behind the work many of us are doing during these enforced sh shutdowns, including the, right now here on Zoom, and that's using digital tools to conduct business. Uh, we want, we're gonna to discuss today how trade policy should not only reflect this new era, but also look to the future of trade and how policy should be developed to enable the future of digital trade and global commerce. We're delighted to welcome today, Ambassador Francis Lisson, Australia's permanent representative to the WTO. Javier Lopez, one of the world's leading thinkers on digital trade issues. And our good friend, Jake Colvin, who runs the Global Innovation Forum which helps inform policymakers about both the opportunities and challenges of engaging in the global marketplace. Thank you all for joining us. And we're very pleased to welcome back Wendy Cutler of the Asia Society Policy Institute, our partner in many of these events. So thank you for joining us today, Francis, Javier, Jake, and Wendy. And with that, Wendy, take it over. Well, thanks so much, Ken. And I'm thrilled to be here again. And um, the Asia Society is thrilled to be um, partnering with WIDA on many of these events. Um, I can't believe we've done so many already. Um, a number of these COVID events, we have taken a sectoral focus, focusing on medical equipment, medicines, and food. Well, today we're gonna take, we're gonna continue that sectoral focus and focus on the digital world. 
Now, COVID has had an impact on the digital world, but the digital world has had a real impact on living in the COVID world. And for all of us, as we're adjusting um, to our new lives, we are just using digital to do um, many things um, that we've used digital tools for in the past, but also we're using them more and we're using them in new areas too. So whether it be medicine or entertainment or teleconferencing um, or just doing our work um, minute to minute, hour to hour, we are all using and relying on digital tools. This trend towards um, increasing use of digital and the explosion of digital trade, this is a trend that was, that was in play long before COVID, but COVID has certainly accelerated the trend and we'll get into that today. And maybe it's done even more than that by adding new dimensions to the digital agenda. Well, as we've been using digital tools more and more, the governments have been working hard to shape rules in the digital area. And there's been so much activity there, including at the WTO, the e-commerce plurilateral negotiations um, are up and running and, and um, working hard towards some new deadlines. And we're thrilled to have um, Ambassador Listen from Australia, one of the, um, um, conveners of the digital work in Geneva to share her perspective. But digital rules, we find them um, um, in the CPTPP where the other countries basically adopted the digital chapter that the US worked on with them before we exited TPP. Um, just this week, we saw this, the signing between New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, of the DEPA, their digital um, trade, pla trade agreement. Singapore and Australia have a digital deal. APEC and G20 are working um, in the digital space along with the OECD, and Javier will tell us more about that work. And the US has been extremely active in their trade negotiations with having a TPP plus digital chapter in the USMCA in its bilateral um, deal with Japan. And they're also working to even expand and improve um, provisions on digital even further in the UK negotiations, which are now experiencing their second round of talks. These negotiations are not easy. We're going to get into that. There are lots of barriers. We've heard about restrictions on data flows. We've, we've heard about countries um, pursuing localization policies. And even you know, this, this issue of um, extending the moratorium on tariffs for electronic transmissions is still on the agenda. But I would say in the past 24 hours, the, the one digital related issue that's certainly gotten the most attention is DST, the digital services taxes. And we'll get into that more this morning. Um, many of you I'm sure who are watching this um, webinar today were glued to webinars yesterday watching Ambassador Lighthizer testify in Congress. And he made very clear that if the digital, if there's not a multilateral solution at the OECD to the digital services tax issue, he's ready to retaliate against those countries who apply such a tax. So we have a lot to cover. We have about an hour. We've got an incredible panel and I'm thrilled to be the one moderating this. So let me start just kind of with, with a kind of a general question to kind of get a handle of this COVID relations with digital. Um, and I'm gonna to turn to Jake Colvin first. And Jake, let me just ask you, how has the COVID um, world kind of um, accelerated the use of digital? And has it accelerated in ways that you didn't anticipate and in that respect, I know, um, you, know you, you have some really useful insights into how small businesses are using the digital tools. So over to you, Jake. Thanks very much, Wendy. And, and thanks uh, to Ken and Diego as well. Um, so I think, you know, as you said already, it's um, what COVID-19 has done is really just elevate the importance of digital tools to every business and, and consumer and citizen. Um, but I also think it's created a new urgency for governments to create a policy environment that ensures that businesses and citizens have access to global digital tools. Uh, and so Ken mentioned that one of the things that I do uh, at NFTC is I work with small businesses through our Global Innovation Forum. Uh, and through that, my colleague Jamaica Gale and I have been speaking with small businesses about their experiences during COVID-19. And so I thought maybe I would just share a couple of takeaways from that. 
the first is that uh, you know small businesses are using a range of digital tools really intensively to manage uncertainty uh, and to really replace physical interactions. Uh, and so to give just one example, we've gotten to know Dana Donafrey, uh, who runs Anna Ono out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so what she does is she sells uh, functional and attractive lingerie and loungewear for breast cancer survivors. Uh, you know, she told us that cancer doesn't stop during a pandemic and her company is continuing to serve its global customers online. Now this is, it's even more important because the physical stores that she distributes your products into are closed. Uh, and so she told us about how she's using Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to remind its community that they're not alone and to share interviews uh, from patients using YouTube. Um, and, you know, thinking about her experience, she relies on this entire e-commerce ecosystem of tools, everything from social media to Shopify as an e-commerce platform, to Google Pay and PayPal for uh, electronic payments, to FedEx um, and other shipping services for logistics and delivery. And just to flag for a product-based business like Dana's, it's really important to get that customs and trade facilitation piece right. And she tells us that clearing goods through customs around the world remains one of her biggest sources of frustration. Um, I think Javier might talk a little bit about um, the increase in parcel delivery. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that's really important to take into account. Uh, maybe uh, one other uh, takeaway is that, you know, we see some small businesses and services sectors in particular, like health and education services, they've seen demand go up for their digital tools. And I don't think that trend is gonna go away. Uh, and I think it's really important to note that, that this is a global phenomenon. And we've gotten to know great companies in the United States and happy to talk about those later, but um, this sort of digitally enabled innovation is happening in every single developing country around the world. You take a company like the Little Engineer out of Lebanon and Dubai, uh, which is developing an online curriculum using YouTube, Facebook, and, and other digital tools that helps young students develop um, sort of pre-engineering skills around things like robotics and artificial intelligence, or Portal Telemedicina in Brazil, who's partnered with Google to build a remote diagnostic surface to detect diseases, and is now using the algorithms that they've developed um, to detect signs of COVID-19 in Latin America and Africa. Um, and so I think those kinds of, these kinds of demands for, for those services, as well as for sort of omni-channel retail that support local businesses that will never have an international customer, that sort of thing's not gonna go away anytime soon. So I think I'll, maybe I'll stop there. Well, that's great and great opening. Javier, maybe I can turn to you. I know that you personally have been doing a lot of work on digital, but the OECD also has been really active in this space. So what are you finding and do you see COVID accelerating a trend or do you really, or do you see new dimensions, things we haven't anticipated and do you think this is a lasting and enduring trend? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Wendy. And let me also um, echo Jake's uh, thanks to, to Ken and to Witter for the opportunity to be here. Um, and just quickly to say at the OECD, what we generally do is we're kind of in the business of providing the evidence base that we hope enables countries to navigate these, these new circumstances. And in that context, we have been doing some work trying to see what's going on. And I think it really echoes what, what Jake has been, has been saying in terms of the new circumstances. So we, we've taken Google mobility data, for example, and using that, we can normalize it to see uh, how workplace mobility has fallen. Uh, we see about a 56% reduction in workplace mobility two weeks after lockdown. We also see great uh, reductions in mobility for retail and recreation. And also the data is showing that there's a huge and unprecedented growth in demand for bandwidth. So you know, we're seeing traffic up by about 20 to, to even 30 or even 40% across, across many countries and sort of highlighting that acceleration where more of us or those that can are working remotely, shopping for groceries online, connecting with family and friends through Zoom and, and teleconferencing and streaming music and films for, for leisure. And, and I, I think here it's, it's really important to highlight the role that trade plays in enabling this to happen. And one of the first things is clearly that trade can help reduce the cost of access to digital networks. So the gateway into, into all of this is highly dependent on, on trade issues. For example, we find that there's a, a negative correlation between the degree of restrictiveness in telecom services as we measure it with uh, an indicator that we have that's called the Services Trade Restrictiveness Index and internet affordability. Um, at the same time, we have to recall that uh, trade enables access to the devices through which we connect to the internet. 
the computers, the laptops, the mobile phones, the screens that we're using, all of those are results of a highly internationalized process of production. And our trade and value added database shows that about 80% of the value added in those products tends to be foreign on average. So clearly, you know, trade has a, has a very strong role to play there, but also drawing on what Jake was saying about the ecosystem and about cross-border trade and parcels. The data that we're uh, uncovering shows that there's been a huge demand in online orders. They're up 50% year on year in Europe and about 100% year on year up in, in the US. And the types of products we're ordering, we're slowly getting bits of information that allows us to, to see what's happening, is basically ICT goods like computer screens and the laptops, but also medical goods and, and items for, for uh, leisure, books and, and games. And we need to be very cautious about this enabling environment and at the border issues, including also thinking about how digitalization can make processes at the border much faster and enable individuals to have access to the goods they need, but also the small firms that Jake was referring to, to be able to keep business continuity during these difficult times. Um, lastly, just to say that, you know, uh, we also need to be very conscious about digitally enabled services, which maintain the economic activities and, and fast track recoveries. And here, one of the things that we've been seeing with our digital services trade restrictiveness indicator is that the barriers that affect digitally enabled services have actually been increasing. And so that's something that we need to think about. And it's in areas or in discussions that take place, as you were saying, Wendy, earlier in the DEPA or in bilateral trade agreements, or perhaps at the joint statement initiative, that we can try and find ways of moving things forward in that in, in, in those discussions. And, and just last to say, I think that one of the things that's still a bit difficult for us is that this is all the trade world. But I think uh, being able to benefit from digital trade and from the opportunities that I highlighted earlier is also dependent on trying to sort out digital divides. I think that people need to be instructed, or people need to have greater access to the digital networks, they need better skills, and also we need to think a bit more carefully about trust. But certainly going back to your point, uh, digitalization or the digital transformation has accelerated, and I think that really highlights that, that the discussions on digital trade now are more important than ever. That's really helpful. I think a lot of people who before COVID, um, who weren't as reliant on digital now realize how this is the new world. And it's really, ex it's accelerated my use and the way I conduct my life for sure. Um, I think you, you really laid the groundwork for how important it is for governments to help shape rules in this area and in order to get like the, the, the benefits of digital probably to, to reduce barriers to this area, to this sector. And this is a great, um, great segue to turn to Francis as um, Australia along with Singapore and Japan is, uh, are leading the um, plurilateral effort in um, the WTO on e-commerce negotiations. Um, just this week, the Ottawa group, um, a group of medium-sized countries um, has called for the, um, for the OEC, excuse me, for the WTO work to be prioritized and accelerated and even asked for a draft consolidated text by the end of this year, I think. So let me ask you, Francis, where do these talks stand? Um, are meetings being held virtually or, or, and can meetings be held in person soon? And what are the prospects for success? Because a lot of people think that, you know what? There's so many hurdles here. There are too many countries and the WTO moves too slowly. So over to you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Wendy. And I'd also like to join others in thanking Ken and Diego for inviting me onto this panel today. Um, as you say, there's 84 WTO members now who are part of the Joint Statement Initiative on Electronic Commerce. And we all committed at the beginning of last year to start negotiating for a high ambitious uh, ambition outcome in, in these areas recognizing that this is such an important and growing part of trade. Now, the intention was that about now, we would be uh, finishing some very intensive negotiations and coming up with a consolidated text to give to the ministers in Kazakhstan and in C12. Of course, that wasn't to happen because of, because of the COVID pandemic. 
and we've had to adjust as, as everybody else has done. Um, so what we've been doing is making sure that work continues because as you say, this is only becoming more and more important and uh, more and more countries are realising how important this is, particularly for their MISMEs, not just for, for, for big companies. So uh, we've tried to keep that work going in, a, in an informal setting, um, but recognising that many have been preoccupied in the last few months. We think, though, it's really important that we get everybody back now. Um, the, the digital tools to negotiate are, are becoming a bit more familiar to people. So um, we've, we've had one meeting, which was more of a process meeting, but we've got two what we call plenary sessions scheduled for July, where all those who are working in small groups are going to report back to the big groups on, on how they're going in finding convergence in their proposals on particular parts of the text. So work is going on, though we are, of course, very sensitive to those countries who can't participate right now because they're going through a, a very difficult time. Um, what, what, what is clear, though, is that we do need to, to um, come up with this consolidated text as quickly as we can, and we need to start thinking about when we're going to conclude the negotiations. The hurdles are very real and they're very tricky and they're, they're very obvious and, and we know what they've been for a long time. Um, but as, as, as an optimist, um, since we know, we know what those issues are that are difficult and they're around data and privacy, um, that, that people have been thinking about it and, and looking at ways to find solutions, even if they're not talking about it and won't talk about that yet for a little while. But there is such a groundswell of enthusiasm for trying to set in place a good transparent framework that provides for non-discriminatory access for, for digital trade um, in the same way that goods and services receive that kind of treatment in the WTO, um, that we, we have a real momentum and it's important that we grab that momentum and keep working really hard so that um, certainly up to hopefully uh, in the next few months, we can, we can start looking at, at setting um, the time frame for getting not just the consolidated text, but also looking when we'll conclude the negotiations. So if my math is correct, about over half now of WTO members are part of the plurilateral. And um, I wonder if others might join. And so what I wanna ask you on one hand, there's probably a balance that needs to be struck. Like on one hand, you probably wanna bring more countries in. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, are you worried as the convener that as more countries join, the, um, you know, becomes harder to form a consensus or that the, the substance could be watered down? Uh, I think for firstly to join, people sign on to the statement about wanting a, a high ambition outcome in this area. So without being very specific on exactly what that means, there, there is a, a goal and an objective that we all have in common. Um, of course, we're open to all any WTO member to join. And, and it's very important that this is a WTO negotiation. Um, it's not a, a, a separate plurilateral that's outside of the WTO. It's a, it's a new way of doing things. It's, a, it's in some ways an experiment on how we can negotiate with the willing. So we are a group of willing countries who want to negotiate an outcome in this area. And um, I have been constantly surprised as we go along just how, how flexible and willing everybody has been. And there is a real momentum and a real uh, um, shared feeling that we absolutely have to have rules in this area in the WTO for it to be credible in the future. Um, so um, sure, it may be that, that, that some find this difficult, um, but I think more and more are understanding how fundamentally important it is for their small business, for the development of their economy, and it's going to be terribly important for post-COVID economic recovery as well. So I think as you know, as 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 the chair, <laughs> that, that we can we can use that common goal and and and, and purpose to, to push forward with this. Jake, maybe I can ask you how is the what priority is the business community attaching to the WTO talks, and do they have a plan B if in fact these talks go on and on without a successful conclusion? 
Thanks, Wendy. You know, I, I think um, the business community is strongly supportive of the WTO talks and uh, really wanted to commend the work that uh, Ambassador Listen and her colleagues from Japan and, and Singapore uh, are doing in this area. And, you know, um, I think she personally has done a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. Uh, and I think there is a real urgency right now for something meaningful to come out of the process this year. I mean, we do think that there should be some table stakes for the discussions, including things like countries should be willing um, to join the ITA, to uh, agree to a permanent moratorium on customs duties, on electronic transmissions, uh, committing to appropriate digital trade commitments, including on data flows and local server requirements, um, agreeing on some uh, appropriate services market access provisions, uh, and then also trade facilitation policies, which are plus ups from the existing uh, trade facilitation agreement. I mean, I think our hope, and, and we're certainly not pinning all of our hopes to the WTO, but I, I think our hope is that that moves forward in tandem, um, or perhaps even ahead of um, other complementary efforts, including things like the US-UK trade negotiations, uh, where I think we would expect to see gold standard chapters on digital trade, customs and small business. Um, and where I, I really do think in, in that set of negotiations, there's an opportunity to build in even better trade facilitation provisions uh, than we did uh, in USMCA, which reflect lessons learned from COVID-19. And then, you know, Wendy, you already mentioned uh, DEPA, the, the new digital agreement between New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the fact that there are other efforts out there um, will hopefully help push the WTO along and, you know, we'll be there uh, in support as well. Okay, well, thank you on that. Now, this is not gonna pivot to um, the digital services tax, which from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is not part of the WTO negotiations. I think you already have your hands full with a lot of other issues, but the, the locus of activity there seems to be the OECD. And just yesterday, apparently Secretary Mnuchin informed some of his counterparts that he would like to take a pause in these negotiations um, I think expressing some concern that they're not moving forward quickly enough. Um, uh, those are kind of dip, I'm using my diplomatic background there. Um, and then yesterday, yesterday's hearing, it became very clear from Ambassador Lighthizer that if those negotiations don't successfully conclude, he is ready to take to, to retaliate against countries that actually put these taxes into effect. So let's kind of unpack all of that. And maybe I can start with Javier. Now, Javier, I understand you don't work in, the, in that division. You're in the trade division. So I hate to put you on the spot, but you are from the OECD. So what can you tell us on where things stand now? And um, you know, where are we going in this negotiation? So, so I'm, I'm afraid I can't give you too much information. As you say, this is stuff that's taking place somewhere else other than the, not in the trade directorate, but in the, the taxation people. I guess what I can say is that as far as I understood, our secretary general released a statement a few hours ago. Uh, and ultimately, I think we are still trying to reach consensus by the end of the year and that the technical work is going to continue. I think it's worth recalling that we still believe that the multilateral solution based on the work that's been done by all these members that have met at the OECD continues to be the, the best way forward. So from our side, it's, you know, it's, it's something that we're, we'll continue looking at and we'll continue trying to find the, the technical solution to, to these issues. Jake, were you surprised by the developments yesterday? I, well, no one gave us a heads up. And so um, in that regard, I was surprised. But, uh, you know, I, I think maybe I would take a step back and say that, I, you, know, I, you know, there's certainly a lot of opportunity that comes out of the COVID-19 crisis, but I also think that there's um, a lot of potential danger. And so uh, DSTs is one of them. And, and I think uh, COVID-19, you know, has the potential to lead countries down the path of digital protectionism, um, which could lead to more of sort of more trade wars and, and tax wars. Um, so, you know, what COVID-19 is doing is accelerating these calls for taxing technology com companies as countries look for more sources of revenue. Um, and so you've already seen a number of countries adopt or propose these unilateral digital services taxes that you mentioned, when Wendy, France, UK, India, Indonesia, Turkey. Uh, and then you saw just recently uh, USTR came out with um, a notification that they were engaging, they were going to initiate Section 301 investigations into a number of those practices. Um, you know, in the recent budget blueprint, the EU has now called for a European-wide DST, 
and a separate single market tax that would uh, fall disproportionately on American businesses. You know, for me, it, it seems like exactly the wrong response at a time where these digital tools are, are a lifeline for small businesses. Um, but they're also discriminatory on their face, uh, and politicians haven't even tried to hide it. And so, you know, what I worry about is that if these digital services taxes advance without a global agreement, they're going to increase trade tensions uh, between the United States and many of our closest trading partners. Uh, you know, I completely agree with Javier that um, really the only answer is a multilateral resolution of these challenges. And I say that even in light of um, Ambassador Lighthizer's testimony yesterday and Secretary Mnuchin's letter, uh, you know, there are lots, there's lots of finger pointing right now. Um, and I, I think it's important that we all take time um, to, to take a deep breath and, and maybe a step back. Um, but I, I think if, if we can't come to a new consensus of what the right international tax framework should be, and if countries continue to pursue these DSTs, you know, I think that inevitably leads to um, increased global trade tensions, but it also undermines the principles of global taxation that's prevented kind of a free-for-all uh, and double taxation of, of companies around the world. Um, we think the right answer are, instead, the right one of the right answers is a non-discriminatory, easily administered tax regimes um, that are, are done in line with existing OECD guidelines. And so, you know, maybe that's a good place for me to stop. Uh, and I, I don't know if Ambassador Listen wanted to comment on that last bit. Um, yeah, Francis, can you just um, describe to us what has Australia done um, in, you know, with respect to this issue? Because my understanding is that maybe they found a way to proceed in, in, in a way that, that is um, reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, what, what we've done is, is extended our normal goods and services tax to cover um, electronically delivered imports and also um, low value imports. So basically for covering electronic commerce um, and in goods and services. We have a flat rate of 10%, so it's applied to domestic as well as um, imports. It's uh, completely non-discriminatory and it's collected by the vendor. So there isn't a lot of paperwork at the border. It's at point of sale um, and with, with, a, with a threshold so that small businesses who have a turnover of less than 75,000 don't have to pay any tax. So um, it's in that way, it's sympathetic to, to small businesses, um, but it's, it's easy to administer and very transparent and non-discriminatory. And we found very good compliance rate. It, it's only been in place for, for a bit over a year, uh, but, but good compliance and, and uh, people are generally quite happy with it. Um, Javier, before we, maybe we can just pivot a little because I know you've done a lot of work on the, the customs moratorium on electronic transmissions. Where does that stand now? And, and why do you think you know, that moratorium is so essential, particularly now in the COVID world? So I think it's really important to highlight that um, one of the stuff, that, one of the things that we do at the OECD is try to uh, make sure that we understand the benefits and the challenges of digitalization. And one of the things that we've done recently is try to look at the benefits of engaging in electronic transmissions. And so we find that, for example, there's smaller firms that uh, use digital tools, websites, and ways of delivering digitally. They're, they're the ones that are better able to exploit international opportunities and gain scale. We also find that the use of digitally deliverable business services is a prerequisite or a very strong condition for export competitiveness across all sectors and also particularly for uh, developing countries which may not have as many uh, domestic substitutes as, as others. So with this, we're, we're kind of a bit worried about some of the discussions that were being had on the uh, moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmissions. My understanding, and Ambassador Listen might, might want to come in on this, but is that uh, the decision will be postponed, so the moratorium continues until MC12, which is supposed to be held next year. Um, so until then, we're, we're okay. But what we've been trying to do at the OECD is try to you know, broaden the debate, which we felt uh, had gone too much on trying to think about the revenue implications without considering the uh, sort of uh, the, the benefits that, that are involved. And if I can just say one thing, you know, this is a difficult area as an economist to estimate. What, is the, what are the values that we're talking about? But whatever way that we estimate them, and even taking the highest estimates that are out there, when we put 
the estimates of the revenue implications of electronic transmissions into perspective, we find that uh, the, the, the revenue implications are actually relatively small, about 0.08 to 0.23% of overall government revenue. So we're not talking about that much in terms of revenue loss, but I think we're talking about a lot in terms of benefits of, of electronic transmissions. Well, thanks. And, you know, just one final question for me. And as a trade person, I almost feel like a trader asking this. And that is, you know, when we look at digital, is this just looking to the future? Is this an issue that maybe we don't just need, we don't need a trade agreement. We need a much broader agreement, given that digital just touches so many different issues like the tax issue, like competition. Um, and it, it, you know, it, 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 cover so many other kind of um, in other governments, it affects the work of so many other ministries that it's kind of hard to bring together by, by trade ministers. And so I just wanted to ask our, each of you do, you, do you think this is an issue that still lends itself to a trade solution? Or do you think as we look to the future, we may want to think, um, you know, just take a fresh look and see if there's a different way to approach this issue. Um, Francis, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Um, I think I think a trade solution is part of the solution on digital digital trade. Um, it's it's important that the trade aspects of of the digital economy uh, uh, have the right framework and the rules based system behind them. That's really important, as I was saying before, to set up a framework that's transparent and non discriminatory. Uh, and that's extremely important for all traders. But as you say, there are many other aspects to this and some really interesting and important ones around patents and intellectual property um, and things around ethics and artificial intelligence. There, there's certainly a lot more work by a lot more organisations, I think, that needs to be done to properly look at all the issues around the digital economy. Um, but I, from, from our perspective, we see that having a, um, some structure around trade in this area uh, is really important step. In, and part of the bigger solution. Jake, what do you think? Sure, thanks. I mean, I guess I, I look at the landscape right now and I'm, I'm skeptical that you could create a new inclusive organization that doesn't suffer from the same politics as the WTO or the OECD. So, you know, I, you look at a country like, a country like India uh, where the government emphasizes the benefits of digital import substitution and slaps a discriminatory tariff on, um, or digital tax on, on uh, global industry and won't even commit to a bilateral dialogue with the United States on digital. And it's just, it's hard for me to see what could create another institution would do. I, I feel like the fault lines would sort of line up just as they have at the WTO. And I think, you know, any new effort that you were to initiate around trade and digital would wind up having a membership that looks a lot like the WTO joint statement initiative on e-commerce uh, and participants would be asking for the same things. You know, I think one, it's interesting, I was thinking about this and I think, you know, there's this history of the WTO of delegates hiding behind this idea that they don't have the right people in the room and need to consult with capital and so can't make commitments to the words that are posted up on the screen. Um, and my understanding is that the WTO is now beginning to enable sort of hybrid negotiating sessions with an option to attend in person or, or via, I guess, an online platform. And I hope that continues because I think it would enable broader participation from capitals, including from, you know, other ministries and remove that excuse that uh, countries don't have the right people in the room. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, contributes to the success of Ambassador Listen's initiative. No, those are some good points. Javier, do you think at some point we're gonna see ministers of digital economy in, in different capitals of the world? I mean, I, I really think that trade is, uh, as, as Jake was saying, important tool for us to achieve a lot of these things. And in particular, I highlight a lot of the principles that are ingrained in the system, the transparency, non-discrimination, avoiding unnecessary trade restrictiveness. All of those are just sensible policies uh, in the digital economy as well. And I think that it's very useful to have uh, uh, the, the WTO and the Joint Statement Initiative. And I agree with Jake that that's where we would end up anyway. Um, but I do think that increasingly we need uh, to think about uh, digital trades more holistically. And, and I guess what I mean by that is that um, uh, 
there needs to be more discussions between policy areas. At the OECD, we're quite good at that because you know, two floors down, we have our privacy people. Two floors up, we have the consumer protection people. And you know, around the corner, we have competition and taxation. So, so we're in a good position to try and help feed into the debate uh, at the WTO Joint Statement Initiative. And I think that that's part of the answer to some of the questions that we're having. But I think also there's a lot of domestic policies that are very important related to innovation, related to skills. And I mentioned also issues related to the digital divide and to getting people connected. So, so I think digital trade and the WTO Joint Statement Initiative is one of the most important international architectures through which this, this takes place. But I think there's also room for other uh, organizations and other principles to feed into that to try and help move the agenda forward. Does the OECD and the WTO um, coordinate and work together on these issues? Um, so from, from my perspective, my job, basically, my job description is to try and be as helpful as possible to whatever is happening at the WTO. That answers that question. Um, and are you helpful? I, I, I mean, that would be Ambassador Listen to, to, to say, but, but ju just to highlight that, I mean, we have a lot of coordination in terms of the issues and, and things like that. And we keep a very open ear to what is being discussed and what we're trying to do is provide the evidence base on those things. So we've done the work on the moratorium, which we hope would be helpful. We've done work on uh, cross-border data flows, trying to map the evolving environment. We're going to be doing work on AI. We're doing work on parcels. So I think all of these and the way that we're structuring our work is to reflect some of the issues that are being discussed at the Joint Statement Initiative. So I hope we are useful. I'm sure you are. <laughs> it's only teasing you. Okay, this is going to conclude my part. I'm going to turn it over to Ken. And I understand we have a lot of questions from the audience. So I hope our part didn't go too long. Over to you. Uh, we're, we're, we're great. Um, I jumped in when I did, especially because the last part of the conversation lends itself to where I want to start with the Q&A that have come in. Remind folks who are watching, there's a Q&A tab. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can submit a question. Please, it's helpful if you identify who you want to direct it towards. Um, so that would be helpful to us. So we have three questions I'm going to direct towards Ambassador. Listen, um, you know, they come from Rochelle Gaynor, Daniel Rangel, and uh, Matthew Schaefer. And they're so, uh, but I'm going to bunch them all together. I hope those folks don't mind. Um, but first of all, how are neg negotiations and discussions taking place digitally right now? How, what functionally, how is that working? Um, that's sort of a function question. Then when we get into the discussions themselves, how do we avoid a patchwork of multi, multiple plurilateral agreements with overlapping rules if we're going that route for now? And ultimately, is the goal to create some sort of evergreen format that would allow other groups to join in in a way that maybe could be taken uh, into a larger WTO agreement by, by all the members? Okay, thanks very much. Well, in terms of how we're functioning at the moment, um, we, we're using video conferencing um, to great effect. <coughs> And, and that's really important because it, having capital experts coming is absolutely essential for, to the progress in our work. Uh, and of course, travel is very difficult at the moment, but um, people can all dial in to video conferences. So we've, uh, we've the small groups uh, where they're discussing converging texts wherever they can uh, are taking place through those, those formats. Um, and in terms of the big plenary discussions in the WTO, the WTO has just started um, what they call hybrid meetings. So we have people with, with good social distancing sitting in a, in a big room, um, and, uh, but, but it, through video conferencing, enabling people elsewhere in Geneva, but also in capitals to, to participate. So it's really, it's really good to see people becoming more and more comfortable with this format and, and being able to use it wisely and, and, and to, to make progress. So hopefully that will continue and that we'll get more and more comfortable and be able to do more negotiations in the future um, through this format, particularly while the travel restrictions are in place. Um, how do we avoid overlapping? Well, I think that's that's the point of what we're doing. There's a lot of, a lot of FTAs and, and, and we started off by, uh, in our discussions, by comparing everybody's FTAs with each other to see how they were dealing with electronic commerce issues and seeing where there's um, 
um, points of difference and points of, of commonality. Uh, but it, it, the point of, of, of us doing it in the WTO is, is to avoid that kind of spaghetti bowl effect, as, as they call it, um, to try and set standards of, 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 of ways to do things. And that's been seen in the WTO to be quite useful in, in many different ways in, in services, for example, in the past. Um, so th this is the idea of, of perhaps like the telecoms reference paper to, to do something where we're setting standards that, that others can hopefully join and, and, and join with later. Um, in terms of uh, how we see this ending up, um, I guess the, the theory is if you look at the old Tokyo codes um, from the gap days where uh, groups of willing would, would go together and, and come up with a sort of a, a, a more ambitious type of agreement in a particular area. And then eventually that was joined by all WTO members when, when the WTO was, was, was formed. Um, so our, our dream is to have every, every member join. Um, I'm not sure how long that will take, but um, that's certainly our, our thought. Um, but it, this is an experiment. It is a new way of doing things under the WTO. And there's a number of legal issues that will need to be worked out along the way. But our thought is, let's, let's see what we want. Let's get something important together in a substantive technical way. And then we'll work out how we actually incorporate it into the legal structure um, when, when it comes to it. Very good. There's a lot of work to do. It seems like uh, full employment for people working in the digital trade space for, for quite a few years to come. Um, uh, Jake, wanna, did you want to say something, Javier? Or Yes, if I could just very quickly, because uh, I mean, I, I'm an empirical economist and it just reminds me uh, of the questions that we've raised on multilateralizing regionalism. And, you know, we've always talked about this many years ago. I was engaged in trying to measure the impact of, of, of regionalism on getting a multilateral uh, kind of outcome. And there's this whole debate about stepping stones and stumbling blocks. And I think that one of the issues that is important to raise is that these things that are being discussed are not, don't necessarily lend themselves to being discriminatory. And if you've got good rules on, on electronic signatures, they're going to be good rules for everyone. So if those good practices can be taken up in a more multilateral way, then I think it's going to, to give loads of benefits and then we're going to be in a really good place. So, so I'm more of a, you know, these are stepping stones and, and, and they're, they're feeding into this, this multilateral process, uh, which is very useful. Very good. Thanks. I'm going to come to Jake next. Um, question about de minimis. It was a big focus of Ambassador Lighthizer's testimony yesterday. I wouldn't say it was the fo singular focus, but it, it got a lot of attention and a lot of discussion yesterday when he was testifying both at the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. And obviously, uh, with a lot of the e-commerce that takes place, um, the, the shipments are often in a smaller dollar amount, not large equipment and that is being sold in that marketplace, but a lot smaller. You mentioned that you work with a lot of small businesses. Um, how is this uh, focus on US de minimis, what might impact might that have on global e-commerce? Sure. Thanks, Ken. You know, I, I mean, I think I saw the question and, um, you know, obviously we would love to see uh, Europe, the UK and, and other trading partners come up to a higher uh, de minimis that, that is closer to the US gold standard of, of $800 for small package shipments. Um, we were certainly disappointed that Mexico and Canada didn't, didn't come up higher in the USMCA negotiations. Um, but, you know, also want to be clear and, and, you know, we've said this to the administration, we said this to Congress, uh, and there's broad bipartisan support in the US Congress for a unilaterally high US de minimis. Um, you know, we think it benefits American businesses, workers and consumers. Um, it benefits American small businesses who might import things uh, that they uh, use for, for their business or, or uh, input into their products. Um, and it reflects the desire of Congress who in 2016 passed this TATIFA Act, uh, which raised the US de minimis threshold from $200 to, to $800. Um, I, so, I, you know, I think you know, I, I understand the administration's sort of allergy to a unilaterally high U.S. de minimis that is not reciprocated by others. Um, but I think some of the solutions that they proposed or, or that are sort of kicking around town uh, in terms of, um, you know, having a de minimis that is uh, uh, sort of equal to or, or, or changes for each country around the world is, is just unworkable. Um, I also think, you know, there, there have been concerns that have been raised about 
um, sort of the methodology for shipments and, and um, circumvention and security and IP theft concerns. And I saw there was a question about, about IP. Um, I, you know, want to be clear that the methodology for how a shipment is declared for clearance, whether that's de minimis or informal entry or formal entry, doesn't compromise security or accountability. Um, you know, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, um, they make these sorts of admissibility decisions um, for all shipments, regardless of their value. Uh, and they in, uh, inspect and intercept shipments um, across all value ranges, whether that's de minimis or informal or, or formal entry. Um, and in fact, lowering or eliminating the de minimis threshold could in fact undercut efforts to target opioids and other illicit shipments um, by requiring CBP resources to flow towards low risk uh, de minimis goods. Thank, thanks for helping us understand that a little bit better, Jake. Um, I wanna come uh, now back to Javier, if I may. Um, the question, and it goes to, this is actually not directly, I think, everything that the OECD is doing, but a lot of the things I think you're, you've been thinking about as one of our, as I put it, one of our leading thinkers on the nexus of digital trade and digital and trade. And that is um, a lot of countries are still, a lot of commercial transactions still take place with paper and, and old tools. And we're talking about digital tools. Uh, what is being done to help country, uh, to help uh, companies and countries update their systems and move into the digital world that is uh, certainly much more efficient. Um, obviously there's some new age technologies like blockchain that uh, people have been working to try to utilize in these spaces. And I'm sure you've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about as well. Um, but uh, what are we doing? And especially now in this COVID time when people, it's, it's literally unsafe for people to be having in-person interactions. What kind of, how are we seeing some of these transitions take place? And do you think this is accelerating some of the transitions that might be net, be useful for businesses anyways? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is an area where we've done a lot of work and particularly my colleagues, uh, Sylvia Ceresco and Evdokia Moise at the OECD. But um, generally speaking, what we're seeing is that the COVID-19 has really accelerated the adoption of digital tools for, for these types of uh, interactions at the border. And my personal perspective on this is that, you know, uh, using digital tools that can expedite processes uh, is one of the most important things to get right on at the moment so that we can enable uh, goods to move uh, faster, particularly also avoiding uh, being too close together in, in physical uh, spaces. One of the things that I would highlight is that we did some work, uh, I think it was last year, on the impact of trade facilitation reforms on SMEs uh, exporting how much they exported and whether they exported or not. And automation tools and adoption of this came as really, really the top uh, measures that enable uh, SMEs to become exporters and also to export more. So just to highlight that, you know, in that sense, we have provided some of the tools that enable countries to see what they can prioritize in terms of reforms. Um, and but but to highlight as well that that uh, I think it's 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 difficult to get it right. But just to touch on blockchain very quickly, this is a technology that for me is important and holds a lot of potential. But I think that we need to take a step back, and there's a lot of things that still remain in paper, and we need to digitize before we can go towards you know the the, the more important uh, elements such as blockchain, which require uh, a whole ecosystem that's already in place. Uh, Jake, I think um, you, you look like you were looking to jump in there. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, just really briefly, and Raul, thanks for the question. I, you know, I think this is a lesson learned from COVID-19 is that, you know, whether it's medical supplies or other essential goods, they have to be released expeditiously through customs uh, in particular so that they're immediately available. And, you know, customs administration is a place where you still have a number of paper-based procedures and documentary requirements and physical verifications, verifications that are necessary. Um, when the goods are still present. And so if you look at what USMCA tried to do and, and what we would advocate for a process like the US, um, excuse me, the, the WTO JSI is that you continue to move back um, processes away from the border with paperless procedures, automated systems, electronic data and payments so that you can clear goods through customs more expeditiously. And I think that that's really important going forward. Uh, thank you. Thanks for helping explain that. Um, uh, Ambassador, listen, um, if I can come back to you, and I, I, I don't know, is, um, is Australia part of the 
Um, the, the digital economic partnership agreement, is that something? And sort of what is the nexus, if you can speak to the nexus of that to the WTO talks that you're leading? Um, Australia is part of a, a, we have a bilateral agreement with Singapore that we agreed to in March called the Digital Economy Agreement. Okay. Um, so we're part of that. So okay. that's, um, as I said, it was, it was done in March. So we negotiated it virtually. So that was, uh, it was a good oh, very good. Up there. <laughs> but it's an agreement that sets a number of, of benchmarks that we think are very useful in, in the area of um, things like e-invoicing, um, uh, areas like um Digital identity, artificial intelligence, things that, that, that we hope would be would be good benchmarks of, for for, for um, what we're doing in the WTO. So, recognizing, of course, that it, this is done between two two countries which which are quite developed um, digital economies and and are, and are more open to, to some of these more cutting edge issues that, than the, the majority of JSI members. But nevertheless, it's a, it sets a it sets a good sort of direction. So we hope that these, um, this one and, and the deeper that you were referring to can set um, good standards for us to, to work towards in, in the JSI. Yes, Wendy, please. Yeah, if I can just add, I think um, it's interesting because um, Singapore seems to be kind of a central player in a lot of these different negotiations so it will be interesting to see if some of these threads kind of come together in some you know, type of regional agreement, particularly in my view, if the WTO negotiations um, don't go forward or quickly. Can I ask Francis one more question? <laughs> sure, and I have one I wanna come back to for, for you, Wendy, okay. and maybe Francis, but you go first. Okay, so just a quick question, and this kind of gets, actually it's a good transition to our program where we'll, future programs where we'll be talking to um, some DG candidates. Do you think this DG selection process is going to impact the pace of the WTO e-commerce negotiations? I don't think so. I think that the e-commerce negotiations, as I said, have a very heavy involvement from capitals. So we're, we're very pleased that we have really good experts from all over the world who take part in these discussions. Whereas the work about the DG selection um, will, will take the, a lot of effort from, from the ambassadors in Geneva and, and of course from, from, from ministers and leaders around the world. Um, but I don't think it should it should uh, impact on, on the pace of our work. Uh, thank, that's good to hear. Um, <laughs> so I wanna come back um, and maybe we'll close with this. Um, certainly Javier and Jake, if you have things to add, but I think this is actually directed a little bit towards Wendy and Ambassador Listen. And Wendy, coming to you a little bit here uh, from your many, many years as a trade negotiator, um, negotiating very high level agreements across many different sectors. Um, but ICT ministries are new in many countries, new uh, compared to certainly longer established functions like uh, uh, trade ministries and ministries of commerce. Um, how well do you see those working? I know, Wendy, you can only speak to when you left government, which is a few years ago now, but uh, working across those different silos, some of these are really technical issues that get into a lot of different spaces that trade ministries are not typically used to playing in. We certainly see it with the DSTs where you have treasuries, treasury ministries and trade ministries, both in conflict and having to work together. You know, are we seeing, do ICT ministers have a regular forum for discussions that's alongside of or parallel to the trade discussions? Are they part of the trade discussions? How does all the functioning of these things work? If you can just elaborate a little bit. Yeah, and I was kind of trying, I was trying to get at that at my, my earlier question. I don't have a great answer here. It clearly um, introduces complications when different ministries have different mandates in the same subject area. And I think it's really dependent on each government to kind of get their act together and to have clear um, guidance from above on who's leading the negotiations and then the relationship between the leading ministry and the other ministries. I always found um, countries were the most effective in trade negotiations when it wasn't like each ministry, you know, each ministry's at the table and they're all talking. It's, I think negotiations um, are, are much more, negotiators are much more effective when there is a central person. It's clear that the other ministries have input 
but they have input to the lead negotiator. And I, you know, that would be kind of my view. But all that said, I do think in, in this space, as we look to the future, I don't rule out that we may need to be a little more creative here. Ambassador, listen. Any any thoughts on 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 your work? I, you know, I'm going to just make a personal reference. Um, an old friend of mine is uh, Julie Inman Grant, who is Australia's e safety commissioner. I don't know if we have that in the United States, but there are certainly in a lot of governments there are a lot of uh, different functions that are developing in 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 these spaces that I know you all have to uh, take learnings from. No, that's right. And, and, and Wendy's absolutely right that there's a, in each government, there are so many different portfolios who are, who are very interested in this, in this new area um, from all different angles. And as you say, the more coordinated you are, the better you are at being able to negotiate uh, internationally. So uh, many countries are still trying to get their act together. At the moment, you can tell the ones that haven't yet, and they keep apologising and saying, "Look, as soon as we get our act together, we'll be putting in proposals and we'll be active and things." But but just give us a little bit longer. So it is something we all need to catch up with, um, so that we can um, find these, you know, common ground between us. Um, yeah, first you have to do it domestically, and then you can do it internationally. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador. Listen, it's a pleasure to have welcomed you to the WIDA platform. Uh, we, all, we have a great relationship at WIDA with the Australian government. We are delighted to have you here as a, a participant today. Jake, as always, it's a pleasure to see you. I uh, look forward to collaborating on many things. Javier, uh, you know I've been trying to get you on the WIDA platform for a long time. Uh, finally was able to do it digitally, so really glad to have you. And Wendy, welcome uh, back again. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week when we um, uh, interview our DG candidate. I uh, hope everybody else joins us again. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our future WIDA events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.